My name is Ryan Lee, and uh, I'm a curator here in special collections here in the library, a manuscript curator. Um, and I'm here today to um, introduce our, our lecturer and to also introduce um, maybe the, the reason why we've set up this series of lectures. Um, I'm a, I, I was, I've had the privilege of uh, being a curator for an exhibit that we've uh, put up here in, in the special collections lobby area um, called A Pillar of Light, celebrating 200 years of the first vision. I've co-curated it with another fellow librarian, Garrett Van Dyke. Um, and as we put this ex exhibit together in celebration of this, um, this marvelous event, um, we, we wanted to put together a, a series of lectures as well uh, to allow, um, allow us a, a, another way to, to celebrate and, and to remember this, uh, this important event and to learn more about it, and, um, and especially things maybe that uh, have, have come out in recent scholarship. Uh, and so we're, this is just the first of a series of lectures that we're planning to span from fall, throughout fall and winter semesters next year leading up to the 200th, 200th anniversary of the first vision next spring. Um, so uh, is, uh, um, I just want to mention now that the, the, the next lecture that we have, um, just to get you, you know, get it on your calendar so you can uh, continue to come and learn more about this, this wonderful event. Our next lecture will actually be um, in a month from now on October 14th at 2 p.m. That's a Monday, Monday, October 14th at 2 p.m. Our speaker will be Professor, Professor Anthony Sweat, um, and the title of his presentation will be Visualizing the Vision. A History of First Vision Art. Uh, if any of you picked up the, uh, the bookmark that we had out there, his, uh, his art has been, is featured on that, uh, an original piece of, of artwork he's recently um, finished and, uh, uh, and is also, that original piece is also on display in our exhibit um, as well. And as, as we plan additional lectures in the future, we hope that you'll be able to attend those as, as well and as a way to kind of personally celebrate the bicentennial of this most significant event in the history of the um, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the restoration of the gospel. But now for today's lecture, um, uh, I, I have the honor of uh, introducing um, Dr. Stephen C. Harper, who will be lecturing, uh, providing a lecture today called, uh, titled, Putting the First Vision in the Pensieve, or How Joseph Remembered. Um, and just a little bit about uh, Steve I want to, to share with you as well. Stephen C. Harper is a professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University here. Um, and in, in 2012, Steve was appointed as the managing historian and a general editor of, of Saints, the story of the Church of Jesus Christ in the latter days. And he was named editor in chief of BYU Studies Quarterly in September 2018. He served in the Canada Winnipeg Mission from 1990 to 1991 and married uh, um, Jennifer Sabring in 1992. They both graduated from BYU in 1994, and he, er he earned an MA in American History from Utah State University, where his thesis uh, analyzed de uh, determinants of conversion to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the 1830s. Chapters were published in the Journal of Mormon History and Religion and American Culture, and awarded by the Mormon History Association with the T. Edgar Lyon Award for Best Article of the Year, and the Juanita Brooks Award for the Best Graduate Student Paper. Steve earned a PhD in early American history from Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He began teaching courses in religion and history at BYU Hawaii in 2000 and joined the religious education faculty at BYU in 2002. That year, he also became a volume editor of the Joseph Smith Papers and the document editor for BYU study Studies. He taught at the BYU Jerusalem Center for Near Eastern Studies in 2011 to 2012. His first book was Promised Land, published by Lehigh University in 2006, a study of Lenape or Delaware Indians' responses to a, a fraudulent 1737 land deal in colonial Pennsylvania. He also authored Making Sense of the Doctrine and Covenants, published by Deseret Book in 2008, Joseph Smith's First Vision, published by Deseret Book in 2012, and The First Vision, Memory and Mormon Origins, published this year by Oxford University Press, along with dozens of articles. The lecture, this lecture will be followed um, with uh, a Q&A uh, with the microphone that we provided here in the corner. Um, and since this uh, lecture is being recorded, we ask that you use the mic um, for, for answer, asking your questions so that those can be recorded as well. Um, and then following the lecture, we'll also be having a book signing in the Special Collections classroom just outside uh, the auditorium entrance here uh, and adjacent to the exhibit. Um, and copies of Steve's most recent book will also be on sale there if you don't have one yet. 
So with that, I'd like to turn the time over to Professor Stephen Harper. Thank you all very much. Can you hear me? Okay. Thanks very much, Ryan. Uh, I feel bashful. It sounded good at the time, right? I drafted that uh, intro, but it feels like I have to talk to my bishop now about, <laughs> about it. Thanks to you, Ryan and Garrett, for this lecture series uh, and, to, and for the display, the exhibit. It's fantastic. If you haven't seen the exhibit, go. If you have to choose between listening to me here and going to that, go to that. Uh, the exhibit is terrific. Um, I'm so thrilled about it. If you're not, if you're younger than I am, you may not, rec you may not have enough history to recognize what a remarkable thing it is that the f accounts of Joseph Smith's first vision are on display, all of them. Um, that they're on the internet. The top two sites you'll hit, top three, as far as I know from doing it today. Uh, when you uh, look for them online are the churches, first of all, the churches site, then the Joseph Smith Papers site right after that, and then an, a variation on the Joseph Smith Papers site right after that. You can get to both of them here with those um, codes. You can find them in your Gospel Library app right now if you need to, want to. There are hard copies or, or paper copies up there for uh, the ones that we'll be focusing on here today. So it's just a remarkable thing to be at this point in time. I'm so excited uh, to be alive today and to be able to study the first vision of Joseph Smith. And I'm grateful for your time and attention. I'm unworthy of it, but I know that the vision is worthy of it. And I hope that I don't get in the way. I hope that I can help you appreciate the vision of the Father and the Son uh, uh, to Joseph Smith a little better. It's become common to account for the variety in the accounts that Joseph gave us of his first vision by saying that he intended them for different audiences. And that, that's, that's true. There's no reason to doubt or dispute that. But I don't think it's the best explanation for why the accounts are different from each other. I'm going to propose a better one here today, at least in my opinion a better one, based on intimate knowledge of all the vision accounts in light of what we now know about the way memories consolidate, which is the technical word for the way memories form and reform over time. To me, the best thing about the Harry Potter stories is the pensieve, the magical bowl of memories in which an observer can sift through another person's past. As a historian, I think that's the coolest possible magic you could imagine. The Harry Potter wiki site says the pensive is an object used to review memories. It has the appearance of a shallow stone or metal basin. It's filled with a silvery substance that appears to be a cloud-like liquid or gas. The collected memories of people have uh, siphoned their recollections into it. And the uh, Pottermore site says the name pensive is a homonym of pensive, meaning deeply, seriously thoughtful, but it's also a pun. The sieve part of the word alludes to the object's function of sorting meanings from a mass of thoughts or memories. So I hope from that uh, dictionary work you can see why we are talking about putting the first vision accounts in the pen sieve. That's exactly what we're going to try to do today, just without the magical bowl of memories. We'll have to use the historian's method as best we can. That means we'll analyze all the available evidence created by the person whose mind we wish to inhabit. And today we're going to do something that hasn't been done before in history. We're going to do it informed as much as possible by the science of memory. So those are our tools. Um, we're very blessed to have those tools. They are limited. And we're going to be up against a lot of obstacles. We're going to have an abundance and a lack of evidence at the very same time. We have lots of what Joseph Smith thought, and then from another perspective, we have almost nothing of what he, he experienced in the sacred grove. We have also a lot of inherent biases, and we won't even be aware of or able to conquer some of them, but we'll do the best we can. We'll try to be aware of the problem that some neuroscientists call W-Y-S-I-A-T-I, -I, an acronym for what you see is all there is. What you see is all there is. This is a bias that's uh, peculiar to, to us as people. 
it means that we assume that our observations tell us everything there is to know, and that's never true. So if we can be aware of that, we'll be better off, and we'll recognize that what we see is not all there is. Let's pay attention to the things that we know that we know. For example, we have four primary and five secondary accounts of the vision, four accounts that came to us from Joseph Smith himself in his own handwriting or in the handwriting of a scribe to whom he dictated the story, and five accounts that come to us from contemporaries, people who lived during his lifetime, who heard him tell the vision and wrote it during his lifetime. Let's be aware of the things we know that we don't know. For example, we don't know what Joseph Smith told about his vision, who and what he told about his vision in the days right after it occurred. Let's be aware of the things we don't know that we don't know. For example, I don't have any examples for that one. I don't know uh, what I would use for an example. Okay? But let's be aware that there's a whole lot that we don't know that we don't know. That will help us with some of our biases. I'm going to ask you for the next half hour or so to try to forget that you've ever heard of Joseph Smith or his first vision. Or at least do your best to suspend the assumption that you know all about it. You're probably willing to do that or you wouldn't be here today. Let's have some fun discovering the very rich documentary record of it as if for the very first time. Let's ask it seeking questions, not declarative questions, the kind that assume the answer instead of seek for it, like this one. Here's a good example of a bad question. When Smith fails to mention foundational visions until years after the event, and gives conflicting and anachronistic or out of historical order accounts of them, how certain can one be that he relates events as he experienced them at the time? This author already assumes the answer to that question. It's not really a seeking question. There is a good answer to this bad question, though, so I'm going to answer it anyway. First, let's engage the accounts and judge them for ourselves. Uh, to what extent are they conflicting and anachronistic? Those are, those are conclusions too quickly reached in this um, question, in my opinion. And I hope that all of you will decide for yourself whether the accounts are conflicting and whether they're anachronistic, and not just take someone else's mind or Brother Vogel's or anyone else's word for it. As we do that, let's also consider that the accounts are not just composed of how Joseph experienced the vision at the time. Okay? They are not just his memory of what happened in the grove. They are, they are memories of his experience over time. Okay? He didn't just have the vision one day and remember that statically. He remembered it throughout time and it changed over time. The meanings that were available to him about what that experience included changed, reshaped, grew over time. Lots of people have noticed what Fawn Brody called embellishment in Joseph's vision accounts over time. You could think that of, as a negative or you could think of it as interpretive memory. In the same way you might think of your patriarchal blessing. You might understand it differently today. You might have interpretive memory of it today, 10, 20, or 30, or 40 years out than you could possibly have known at the time. You might, have, you might remember the facts of the blessing at the time better a long time ago, the day it happened. But you may remember and have better sense of what it means today than you did on the day it took place. That wouldn't be surprising. So it wouldn't be surprising if we found that same kind of development in Joseph Smith's memories of his first vision. We also need to be very uh, mindful that the accounts are are a mixture of past and present. Some great memory scholars have, have put that point this way. Professor Schachter from Harvard said, just as visual perception of the three-dimensional world depends on combining information from the two eyes, perception in time, remembering, depends on combining information from the present and the past. Very important to understand that when we think about memory. It's not natural for us to think about memory that way, but it's accurate for us to think about memory that way. Here's the way uh, Roger Shattuck put the same point. Merely to remember something is meaningless 
unless the remembered image is combined with a moment in the present. Okay? There's no point in um, thinking about a past, and there's maybe not even an ability to do so unless we do it in the present. That might seem counterintuitive to us, but that doesn't make it false. There's lots, lots of really good memory research that has proven it to be true. Okay? When I say it, let me restate. What I mean is that our memories of our own past are not like a computer file or a video on a DVD that we could store away intact and then go back and replay exactly the same way at any time. They are not. Rather, they, they are present creations. We make them in real time. We make them out of stuff, to be sure, what Professor Schachter calls traces. Traces that are somehow um, stored inside of us, but that are not the full-blown memory. This uh, abstraction came home to me one day while I was watching my son play with a set of Legos. He had a new set, and it was one of the, the kind that come in a small box with the picture on the box of the thing you're supposed to build. And all the pieces for that thing are in the box. So he built that thing, then he took it apart, and he rebuilt it differently. Same pieces, not all of them. He picked and chose, and he built a, something that was very like what he had before, but different, too. And I thought that is a good analogy for Joseph Smith's memories of his first vision. A present creation made out of stuff, traces available to him, stored somehow in his mind, and his present. Okay? His present circumstances shaped very much how he remembered his past. That's true for me, and it's true for you, and it's true for Joseph Smith. So given that way of thinking about memory... The best way to get at his vision accounts is to ask what was the present that gave us each one of these memories from him. And I would like to uh, suggest to you that in asking that question, a, um, a major factor in the shape of his various vision memories is the minister's rejection. Remember that in the account that's in the Pearl of Great Price, he said that a few days after the vision, he was in company with a Methodist minister who had been influential in getting him and other people to think seriously about their need for conversion to Christ. And Joseph Smith said he told the minister his vision, and the minister flatly rejected it. said visions ended with the apostles. There never would be any more. That rejection, I believe, is a huge influence in the various ways Joseph Smith recalled his vision throughout time. I hypothesize that every account can be read best in light of how it relates to the minister's rejection. Okay? I think that each of them relates in a little different way to that rejection, but if we think about that way, it will help us understand why the ac account says what it does or works the way it does. In other words, what would happen if Joseph was so deeply wounded by that Methodist minister's rejection at age 14 that he did not tell anyone else and then tried to write an autobiography 12 years later at age 26? still smarting from the rejection, from trauma, I think, from that rejection, a few months after he'd been beaten and tarred by antagonists in Hiram, Ohio. I think the answer to that question is the circa summer 1832 account of his, of his history. So if you have that handy, one way or another, grab it now. And I'm going to tell you some of the characteristics it has, and then we'll look at it very closely together. This kind of memory, this, this is um, the, uh, a major chunk of Joseph Smith's earliest effort, as far as we know, to write an autobiography, which he was reluctant to do. So he has, a, he has quite a dilemma. The Lord told him the day the church was organized two and a half years earlier, let there be a record kept. You've got to keep a careful record of all the great and important things that the Lord is doing through you. And Joseph knew that in principle, but he was, uh, felt incapable 
of fulfilling it. Certainly by himself he did. So two and a half years later, the Lord barks at him pretty good in the first few verses of section 85 of the Doctrine and Covenants. and says, I really meant it. You have got to keep a record. And about, that, about the same week that revelation is given, Joseph Smith starts this. We don't know exactly when he starts this, but we do know about that same week he starts a journal and he starts um, keeping track of his letters. And in the first one, letter in the same book in which this autobiography is the first six pages, he writes the lines, O Lord, deliver me from the narrow prison of paper, pen, and ink, and a crooked, broken, and scattered language. Beautiful words. And then he crosses them out, as if he's unsatisfied with them. <laughs> and in the first part of this history, he's going to tell us why it's not going to sound very good in our ears. Right? He apologizes right off the bat by telling us he didn't get to go to school very much. He's not very learned. And indeed, the thing is hardly punctuated at all. And some creative spelling uh, and some misplaced modifiers and so forth. Nothing like a, uh, un unlike a freshman paper here on campus, but uh, it made still Joseph Smith feel pretty self-conscious. Sorry, that went flat, didn't it? Sorry. <laughs> I got probably a lot of freshmen in the room who didn't think that was funny at all. I'll work on my, my shtick a little bit before we do this again. Joseph, in other words, feels a terrible dilemma. He knows he has to record the marvelous acts that the Lord does through him. That's the first line of this, of this document. But he also feels terribly inadequate to do so. So he hesitates. He postpones. He tries to get help every time he does it. He tries to get somebody more literate than him, more capable of writing than him. So that is a factor in this present moment. Another one is that when you sit down to write an autobiography, you cue your memory in a different way than if you just spontaneously have a memory, if a cue comes out of the blue. So Professor Schachter calls this strategic retrieval. I'm going to sit down, I'm going to tell my story. Now let's see, where does my story begin? That's a strategic retrieval of a memory. You build it differently. You build that Lego set differently if that's your first uh, premise than you would if out of the blue you just um, started to build with the Legos, okay, without any preconceived plan. All right, if we were to sit down in this situation with Joseph Smith and say, okay, what's my story? Where does it begin? We might... Um, consciously or unconsciously, psychologically respond to that minister's rejection. And we might find ourselves writing to please or appease him, or at least the culture he represents. We don't want to get hurt again. We don't want to be rejected again like that. And so we might tell our story in a way that tr pleases God and pleases the Methodist minister, if we possibly can pull that off. So we might give it the characteristics of uh, a Methodist conversion experience, kind of a generic Methodist conversion experience, where we were convicted of our sins and we received Christ's forgiveness. We might put emphasis on things that we have in common with the Methodist minister, and we might de-emphasize the things that we don't share with that minister. God and Christ as separate beings. Um, no creeds are abominable to God, for example, in this memory. No, their professors of Christianity are all corrupt. No emphasis on persecution and no opposition from Satan. Okay? It doesn't mean those things didn't occur. It just means we don't have them present in this memory. For exactly what reasons, none of us can, can discern. But think about the possibility that either consciously or, or unconsciously, Joseph is responding to that minister as he responds to the commandment of the Lord to keep his history, to write his history. And he tries to do it in a way that will sound okay to both of them. I believe that in doing that, it doesn't sound okay to him. Okay? There's a very interesting set of facts about this document, including Joseph Smith seems to suppress it. Okay? It's in the church history library. But nobody in the 1830s seems to know about it. Oliver Cowdery was called to keep uh, history, and he did. He wrote a bunch of stuff 
published it in the church newspaper and said a couple of times in that process that he was waiting on Joseph Smith to supply source material for the stuff that only Joseph knew. And it doesn't seem like he ever got it. There's no, nothing in Oliver Cowdery's writings that tell us he ever knew the contents of this 1832 history of Joseph's. John Whitmer succeeded Oliver Cowdery in that effort. There's nothing in, in John Whitmer's writing that tell us he ever knew about this 1832 document. There is stuff in Orson Pratt's uh, 1840s statement about the first vision that clearly overlaps. Uh, he either saw the document or Joseph Smith told him some of or all of the same uh, stuff in it. Somehow Orson Pratt had access to it. But as far as we can tell, in the 1830s, Joseph Smith wrote this document and then didn't show it to anybody. Okay. There's either a conspiracy on the part of all of them to keep it quiet, which I think is less likely than the idea that Joseph writes it out as a draft. And then just like that letter on the next page where he crosses out a bunch of the lines, he thinks, that's just not adequate. The vision defied all description. How in the world can I put it down on paper? And I think he probably sticks it in his pocket and thinks, I'll work on that another day. I'll figure out how to do that better some other time. Okay, so in my point then is um, what we have here, if I'm right, if my theory is right, I'm not claiming it is, it's subject to a, a good debate, which I hope will take place over the next generation. If, if I'm right, though, what we're going to get in this account is an account that's true, but maybe not true enough as far as Joseph himself is concerned. Not true to his 1832 present, for example. Remember, he has just recently received a vision of the heavenly glories. He's received section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants, introducing us to the, the concept of temple ordinances uh, in order to receive a fullness of God's salvation. So his present and uh, a generic Methodist conversion experience as a teenager aren't fitting neatly together. And if all of this is the case, then when he gets done with this 1832 document, he feels dissonance. He feels dissatisfaction inside himself about it, which he often did. He, he feels torn. He feels torn between the Lord's command to keep a record and his sense of inadequacy about doing it. With all that in mind, let's look at it closely. Let's read it. I don't think I'll read all of it. I'll count on you uh, to do that. Uh, but I'm going to read the first paragraph on on your page one of five if you're looking at the hard copy or the, the chunk that starts at about the age of 12 years if you're looking at it some other way. At about the age of 12 years, my mind becomes seriously impressed with regard to the all-important concerns for the welfare of my immortal soul, which led me to searching the scriptures, believing as I was taught that they contained the word of God and thus applying myself to them. My intimate acquaintance with those of different denominations led me to marvel exceedingly, for I discovered that they did not adorn their profession by a holy walk and a godly conversation agreeable to what I found contained in that sacred depository, the Bible. This was a grief to my soul. In the next part, he tells us that he spent years pondering these things, thinking deeply about them. He tells us uh, indirectly that he flirted with the ideas of the deists, um, Maybe he's not fallen. Maybe he's not a, a sinner. Maybe the deists are right about the way the universe works. But he says the more he thought about that, the more he concluded that the Bible's God was the God of nature. And that brought him back to his problem of being convicted of his sins and needing redemption through Christ and not knowing where he could find it. So he tells us that, uh, skipping over to the next page, Therefore I cried unto the Lord for mercy. There was none else to whom I could go to obtain mercy. And the Lord heard my cry in the wilderness. And while in the attitude of calling upon the Lord in the sixteenth year of my age, a pillar of light above the brightness of the sun at noonday came down from above and rested upon me. I was filled with the Spirit of God, and the Lord opened the heavens upon me. And I saw the Lord, and he spake unto me, saying, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. All right, so uh, notice here then that we have not an explicit mention of two divine beings. The Lord opened the heavens upon me, and I saw the Lord. This is the most contested passage in this account of Joseph's vision. His critics say he can't even remember how many divine beings he said. Early on, he says, I saw only the Lord. 
Later on, he says, I saw father and son. I don't think that's the best way to understand what he's saying here. If we read all the evidence together, he tells us three times in other accounts, one of which we'll look at in a moment, that he saw one divine personage who then revealed another one. And I think if we read this in light of that, and maybe in light of him not wanting to inflame the whole Protestant culture against him again, that he might be saying, I saw Heavenly Father, and he showed me Jesus Christ. And he said, Joseph, my son, your sins are forgiven you. Okay? Entertain that possibility for uh, interpreting what Joseph Smith means. In fact, generally speaking, entertain charitable possibilities for interpreting what historical figures mean. And you'll be better off than if you're always hostilely uh, uh, positioned to interpreting what they mean. Okay? Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. quotes more of what the Savior says to him. And at the end of it, he says, My soul was filled with love. For many days I could rejoice with great joy. The Lord was with me, but I could find none that would believe the heavenly vision. Nevertheless, I ponder these things in my heart. Either he doesn't tell his family, or his family doesn't believe him. I think the likeliest possibility is he tells that minister and is shocked at the rejection he receives, because I think he thought that he had just received a Methodist conversion experience in the woods. Okay, over time, it might be clear to Joseph Smith that that's not exactly what happened. But at the time, I think it's quite likely, he thinks, I, I just had what the other Methodist converts have, have testified that they're having too. He told, tells a friend, uh, a bunch of friends late in his life, that he had been to the Methodist meetings and wanted to feel and shout like the others who were getting converted, but I could feel nothing. And so his vision may well have the first interpretation of it in his mind may well have been, I just finally had a great Methodist conversion experience. I'm finally born again. I'm okay in God's sight. I'm excited to tell the Methodist minister. If so, it's all the more painful when that minister tells him, no, you didn't. Okay, You've been so low, and now you, the Lord has brought you high, and now I'm just going to knock you right back down again and tell you that that great redemption you tasted after a great struggle to find it isn't really valid at all. Think how painful that is. Think how challenging it's going to be for him to cope with that over the years and figure out what it means and how he's going to interpret his vision and understand it. All right, what would happen if Joseph, age 29 now, is not trying to write autobiography? He's just having a conversation with this interesting fellow from New York, who's come to visit him. They're both trying to figure each other out. They both claim to be prophets of a sort, and they're very interested in each other. And so they're conversing back and forth, sort of comparing their prophetic credentials. And in his uh, part of the conversation, Joseph says, let me tell you about the series of events that led to the Book of Mormon being published. And this kind of memory will be a spontaneous retrieval. It'll be quite different from sitting down to write autobiography. It's not pre-planned. It just bubbles up in Joseph as he cues his mind to tell this guy the story of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. In that context, he locates the vision as the first event in the series of events. That's the first time in the historical record that he calls it first. He doesn't call it first vision. As far as we know, it's Orson Pratt in the late 1840s that coins that term. But he says first. The first time I had an experience with God was this vision, and it led to the next time I saw an angel who told me about the book, and that led to the translation of the book by the power of God. So um, this account will, will sound different. This one is the only one that I don't think is, is shaped by Joseph's concern about the Protestant establishment. Second. That means I'm supposed to stop soon. Um, I think all the other accounts are concerned with responding to the Protestant establishment, to that minister. I don't think this one is so much. It's kind of free and loose and fast-paced. This is one of my favorite ones. I have four favorite accounts, primary accounts, of the first vision. This is one of the four. It's in the top four. Being wrought up in my mind, this is his no, uh, November 11, or 9, 1835 journal entry. Being wrought up in my mind respecting the subject of religion 
And looking at the different systems taught the children of men, I knew not who was right or who was wrong. And considering at the first importance that I should be right in matters that involve eternal consequences, being thus perplexed in mind, I retired to the silent grove and I bowed down before the Lord under a realizing sense that he had said, if the Bible be true, ask and you shall receive, knock and it shall be open, seek and you shall find. And again, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. Information was what I most desired at this time, and with a fixed determination to obtain it, I called upon the Lord for the first time in the place above stated, or in other words, I made a fruitless attempt to pray. My tongue seemed to be swollen in my mouth so that I could not utter. I heard a noise behind me like some person walking towards me. I strove again to pray but could not. The noise of walking seemed to draw nearer. I sprung upon my feet and looked around but saw no person or thing that was calculated to produce the noise of walking. I kneeled again. My mouth was opened and my tongue liberated, and I called on the Lord in mighty prayer. A pillar of fire appeared above my head. It presently rested down upon me and filled me with joy unspeakable. A personage appeared in the midst of this pillar of flame, which was spread all around, and yet nothing consumed. Another personage soon appeared, like unto the first. He said unto me, Thy sins are forgiven thee. He testified unto me that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I saw many angels in this vision. I was about 14 years old when I received this first communication. All right? So if my theory is right, this account, spontaneously retrieved as it was, is relatively unburdened by the problem Joseph confronts every time he sits down to write an autobiography of any sort. As soon as he does that, his mind goes back to that occasion, and that brings up trauma, right? The rejection of the minister. In some way or other, Whatever memory comes out, then, is a response to that minister. I think the 1832 account tries to be conciliatory toward the minister. And I think that's one reason it probably isn't very satisfactory to Joseph Smith's 1832 present self. Okay? The 1835 is unconcerned with the Methodist minister. Just a dumping out, a wonderful, fast-paced flood of the experience as Joseph um, as Joseph. Uh, experience it in that present. All right, then let's look closely at the one you know best, the one that's in the Pearl of Great Price. What would happen if Joseph Smith, age 33, started writing autobiography after being driven from Ohio by enemies, and then before then he could write more than a few pages, he's jailed in a cramped, cold, stinking dungeon cell in Missouri while his wife and children and followers flee the governor's order to the militia to drive them from the state. And what would happen if he started dictating history again, just a few months later on the other side of the Mississippi River, having finally escaped Missouri hell? What would happen, in other words, if he wrote history after the worst, most persecuted year of his life? In that case, it might start like this. Owing to the many reports put in circulation by evil disposed and designing persons, like you're spitting it out. And you might pepper it with the word persecute, persecution. You might say hot persecution, bitter persecution. Okay, the, That account might sound like you're still pretty upset about the unjust treatment that you and your people have received over the years. And you might be a more mature prophet at this point. You're not still quite... Um, the younger prophet who, when he starts to remember his history and feels uh, uh, any sort of psychological response to that minister's rejection, has a desire to be conciliatory. Okay? At this point, there is no conciliatory in the memory. I knew it. I knew God knew it. And I could not deny it. I don't care what the Methodist minister tells me. I could not deny it. And I'm not going to. Right? Do you, do, you, do you hear the tone in that 1838-39 memory? Read it again carefully and you'll see it. You'll notice it. There are some fascinating things about this memory. It is, more than any of the others, a mix of, of interpretive memory, the kind you can only accumulate over time, and factual memory, the kind you have at the time or very shortly after. So think about this, the factual memory you encounter in this memory is sometime in the second year after moving to Manchester. It was a clear day, spring 1820. There was unusual religious excitement. It started with the Methodists. I read James 1.5. I 
It was my first attempt at vocal prayer. There was a thick darkness. There was an actual, if unseen, being. There was a pillar of light exactly over my head. There were two personages. And there was a minister who treated me with great contempt. But think about all the interpretive memory. Great persecution, hot persecution, the bitterest persecution. It has often caused me serious reflection both then and since. That's a clear cue that he is interpreting this memory over time. He is replaying that experience and trying to figure out what it means and how he should think about it and why it, it, it's uh, so repugnant to some people when it was so glorious to him. He's done a lot of thinking and he's done a lot of serious reflecting both then and since. How very strange it was that an obscure boy, a little over 14, and one who was doomed to the necessity of obtaining a scanty living, that whole passage is an interpretive memory. It wasn't available to Joseph Smith in uh, March, April, May, June of 1820. It's available to him on the other side of Missouri. Okay? It's available to him when he thinks about his whole life in the context of what he experienced in the sacred grove. Listen to this part. I have thought since that I felt like Paul as when he made his defense before King Agrippa. Joseph Smith doesn't feel that way right after the vision. He feels that way after subsequent experiences have given him more context in which to interpret the vision. Okay? When he thinks back on a life of persecution to where it all began, it all began that day, a few days after I walked out of the grove and I told that guy about it who I hoped would accept me and validate my experience, and instead completely rejected me. And ever since then, notice uh, you'll read in there that he says, it seems like it's been this way my whole life, since infancy. And some people, Fawn Brody and others, have said, you know, there is zero evidence that Joseph Smith was persecuted as an infant. That's because he wasn't persecuted as an infant. He never said he was persecuted as an infant. He said, it seems like that. It seems like that's how my life has gone. It's an interpretive memory. It's not a factual memory. He's not saying, I remember when I was a toddler and that fellow came up and horsewhipped me. Okay? That's not the memory. He's saying, you know, do you know what it feels like to be me? It feels like my whole life has been opposed by the powerful people around me. Okay? Differentiate between his interpretive memory and his factual memory. All right. I'll be quick. Something very cool has come to light. Uh, we now have a, a, an 1841 or so copy of this memory, right? So think about that. What would happen if Joseph looked at his history, the one we were just talking about, a year or two later in a different setting? He's living peacefully in Nauvoo, Illinois. He's surrounded by faithful followers gathering by the thousands to carry out his vision for a new temple. Fawning legislators have given Nauvoo a protective charter. Missouri is fading into the distance, and Carthage is not yet on the horizon. And so we look at our history we just wrote a couple of years ago, and we think, wow, I was upset that day. Oh, that's pretty intense. And so we give another version of that. We cut off that opening part. That sound, that's defiant, owing to the many reports put in, put in circulation by evil disposed and designing people. We cut the interpretive memory of being like Paul, that part I love so much. I had seen a vision. It was true. I was led to say in my heart, why persecute me for telling the truth? I knew it. I knew God knew it. I wouldn't dare deny it. We just take, Joseph takes that out, okay. that interpretive memory. In other words, he leaves the factual memory but some of those interpretive memories that were quite specific to that moment in the present, that post-Missouri present when he wrote it, those get dropped out and we get a version of that same uh, document that is all of the factual memory with big chunks of the interpretive memory cut out. I think that's very instructive. All right, finally, what would happen if Joseph at age 36 received a letter from the editor of Chicago newspaper? or a historian from Philadelphia asking very kindly if he would furnish them with his story so they could accurately inform their readers. Well then, in that present, you get a little different kind of version of the story. You get a matter of fact, straightforward, succinct telling. It's less emotional, it's more logical. 
You're not writing to a Methodist revival preacher. You're writing to the educated people of the country. You throw in a little Latin that you've learned along the way when they've taken you to court over and over again. And you do some PR. You don't say that their professors are corrupt and their creeds are an abomination. You paraphrase what you heard in the vision. The, the Lord told me that all religious denominations were believing in incorrect doctrines and none of them was acknowledged as his church and kingdom. You tell the same story, but you tell it in a different present. Okay? I hope that makes sense. All right, a highly regarded non-Latter-day Saint historian uh, offered this answer to the declarative question that we read earlier. He said, critics of Mormonism have delighted in the discrepancies between the canonical account, the one in the Pearl of Great Price, and earlier renditions, especially that 1832 account. Such complaints, however, are much ado about relatively nothing. Any good lawyer or historian would expect to find contradictions in competing narratives written down years apart and decades after the event, and despite the contradictions, key elements abide. That's my uh, testimony to you as well. Um, beyond that, I testify that the accounts are true. Uh, Joseph Smith had a vision in the woods of western New York sometime in the spring of 1820. Don't get hung up on the things that are unimportant. Some people spend a lot of time trying to figure out exactly which day. Fine, but don't miss the boat if you do that, okay? The most important thing to learn is that if any of you, any of you lack wisdom, you may ask God, and he will answer. He will give to you liberally. You could go home from your experience like that and say, I have learned for myself as Joseph testifies he did. I'm grateful for the first vision. I want to give my life, I've given a decade of my life to studying as intensively as I possibly can, and I don't even want to stop that. It's so exciting. It is the uh, great testimony that our Father in Heaven loves us now, here, in this dispensation, as much as He's ever loved His children, and that He'll reveal Himself to us, and that we can, when we're anxious teenagers convicted of our sins, we can find redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. That's the greatest good news he ever heard. I'm thankful to, to know that, and I hope that you share that with me. I say it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. Ryan, Garrett, do we have time for questions, or I go too long? All right, we could, we could have a few questions if you're interested. Yes, please. The question I have is about interpretation. I know a lot of people struggle with these accounts and they're frequently trying to reconcile different details. And what I'm trying to figure out is if it's possible that the interpretation could be that he wasn't quite sure exactly what he saw. He saw this splendor, he saw this, uh, he had this experience, whether he heard something or perceived what they were telling him. And then later, when he's receiving revelations or bringing up the with his new knowledge of the nature of God, he was imposing that back on his experience. Yeah. And this is why we get different age, age 16 and one, age 14 and the other. One account he's asking for forgiveness, another one he's asking about which church is true. Yeah. One God, two gods. And so it's possible, it is, it's possible, one point interpretation is that he's not quite sure of the, the when and the where and what he saw and how he saw it. And it was just sort of vague and too much for him to, to mm -hmm. I think that's possible. I, I, I have no way of knowing, right? I'm locked into a historian's small toolkit. Um, but I think it's inevitable that his subsequent experience does not come to bear on the way he remembers his vision. So I think that's, uh, we could take that for granted. I think it's also the case that his semantic memory will fill in the gaps of his autobiographical memory. Meaning, the stuff he knew simply from, live, from breathing the air, when and where he lived, will inform the way he tells his story. Uh, you and I have gaps in our autobiographical memories. We're probably not aware of most of them. We don't think consciously about them. But when we tell them, 
we fill in those gaps with automatically from our semantic memory, from just what we know because we live. All right? Um, I hope that's helpful. I know it obfuscated a little bit. I've honed that skill over the years. When students ask questions you don't know, you pontificate. Hope they'll forget what they originally asked while you go off. So, great question to which I don't have a very good answer. Chris? Oh, yeah. I'd like to hear um, Hard to know exactly what to do with it. This one is the one from May 24th, 1844, about a month before Joseph is killed. And it's written by Joseph's German Jewish dentist convert friend uh, who's come to Nauvoo after being converted in England and is in a small group of people to whom Joseph is confiding his vision and some other really pretty cool and confidential stuff. Um, and Nyberg gets it down in his broken English. It's quite beautiful. Check it out in your, um, in your app or online. It's full of stuff I wouldn't um, try to claim as doctrine. For example, it gives us a, an Aryan god, white-skinned, blue-eyed. Uh, since that's not anywhere otherwise revealed or so forth, I, I'm not going to spend an hour trying to convince my students that they should think of that way of thinking about God. But it's full of other stuff that I find really valuable to, to talk to students about, including the Methodist context primarily of the vision. This one gives us better sense of what Joseph means when he says, I was partial to Methodism and felt some desire to be united with them than anything else. Because in this account he says, I went to the Methodist revival meetings and I wanted to feel and shout like the rest of the people who were being converted, but I could feel nothing. So that is my best cue to interpreting what I take to be Joseph's really big dilemma, which is, are the Calvinist Presbyterians right, which I think, but I fear, I hope desperately I'm wrong about that, but it sounds like they are because I'm 12 years, 13, 14, I'm convicted of my sins. Everything the Presbyterian minister tells me about how awful I am seems to be borne out by my personal experience. And I've tried to get any indication that I can do something about it and get God's redeeming love like the Methodists are teaching me, and I can't. Try as I might, I can't. I wanted to feel Methodist conversion and I could not feel it. So he's, he's having trouble. Some people read verses 10 and 18 in the history that's in the Pearl of Great Price as if they're at odds with each other. I just think they're not attuned enough to what he's really saying. What he's really saying is, my head thinks one thing, and I thought about it all the time. And my heart thinks a whole other thing. And that thing my head was thinking, that the Presbyterians are right, and I'm going to be damned, I never let that into my heart. I never let that sink down deep. I desperately kept looking for some alternative. And I tried to find it at the Methodist meetings, but I could feel nothing. So the evidence, like the, the, he hopes for a Methodist truth, but in his quest to find evidence to confirm it, it comes up empty. That leads him to think maybe the Presbyterians are right after all. I desperately hope not. In that desperation, that dilemma, what do we do? We go to the woods. And... Uh, God solves that teenager's spiritual crisis and millions of other teenagers' spiritual crises over the years with that vision. Is that what you're thinking about, Chris? Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that account. It has an interesting history, too, I'll we'll get into later. Relative to the first vision, or are you thinking yeah. broader than that? Well, there are three. Can I give you three? Yeah. There are three arguments against the first vision. 
Everything else is just a repetition or a combination of those arguments. The first argument was by the Methodist minister. That simply does not happen anymore. It's absurd to claim a vision. There have been no vision since the apostles and there never will be. That's, uh, that's an a priori argument. Uh, it, it's one based on reason, based on assumptions, but not on experience, right? How in the world does he know that? You'd have to be God to know that, and he's not. So the argument is, is not worth anything at all. Joseph Smith knows more from his experience than that minister can teach him about God. So I reject that argument for that reason. The second argument was raised by Fawn Brody in the 1940s in her biography of Joseph Smith, where she said he remembered it, he made it up late. He, there's no evidence from the time that he had that experience. There's no newspaper report, there's no neighbors who remember in their memoir or in a journal entry. I remember Joseph Smith, the kid down the street, said he had a vision. Nothing from the time, so she concludes that he made it all up in, in the midst of, of a crisis in 1837-38. When the uh, 1832 and 1835 accounts came to her knowledge in the 1960s, she subsequently wrote a second edition, and all she did was move the time of Joseph making it up back a few years. It's the same argument. Joseph made it up, but it had to be earlier than she thought because we now had an 1832 and 1835 account that she had to reconcile with. Those other accounts then added to her argument. She said, well, we can see here clearly what he did. He embellished the story over time. Uh, I would grant her that fact, just not her interpretation of what that fact means. Okay? I, I, I'm perfectly willing to say the accounts get um, not without exception, but generally speaking, the accounts get sort of uh, more fleshed out over time. Um, but she doesn't have the monopoly on what that means. I think there's good uh, explanations for what that means in terms of interpretive memory and Joseph's present. Then finally, in the 1960s, the Reverend Wesley Walters, and there's a terrific um, uh, bit on Reverend Walters in the display across the way here. He advanced a novel argument. He, he came up with a new way of going about attacking the first vision. He said, you know, you can't, tell whether there was a vision in the woods of western New York. You can't prove or disprove that. But you can tell whether Joseph Smith is telling you the truth about his verifiable facts. So when he says there was an unusual excitement on the subject of religion in the neighborhood where I lived, you can test him on that. And Reverend Walters combed the archives for any evidence of that that he could find and concluded there was no revival in Palmyra Village in 1819 or 20, and therefore it did not catalyze a vision in the woods near Manchester in the spring of 1820. Uh, he made a couple of fallacies in that argument, and you can bet that they were quickly exposed by a team of historians who were led by a philosophy professor here on campus named Truman Madsen. And all the wonderful, wonderful scholars that I learned what I know about the first vision from, they were youngsters in those days. And Brother Madsen sent them out to New York, to Boston, to everywhere they could go, and they combed the archives. And as a result of that, they pretty well overturned the Reverend Walter's findings. He too narrowly con uh, co um, confined Joseph in time and space. And if you actually listen to what Joseph says, he never claims the unusual excitement on the subject of religion was in Palmyra Village. He says the whole district of country, that's a Methodist term. He knew what it meant. He's saying something to like the whole Catholic diocese or the whole LDS stake around me. The whole district of country was affected by it. The whole region was full of this unusual excitement. Professor Backman dug up a mountain of evidence that uh, verifies that. There's no doubt that Joseph's Verifiable facts fit nicely within the context. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I'll top that off by this. Um, I got an excited note from Ann Taves. That name might not mean anything to you, but it means a lot to me. She is a highly regarded scholar of religion at the University of, of California, Santa Barbara, who studies uh, religious movements, including the, the restored gospel, intensively. She takes the historical record seriously without taking it at face value. 
She's, she's a naturalistic explainer of things. In other words, everything to her has to be explained in terms of what you could observe um, in the natural world. She can't explain it in terms of supernatural forces the way I am I'm, I'm comfortable doing. She's an absolutely terrific scholar, and we've collaborated on a, a thing about the first vision before. She wrote to me excitedly a week or so ago saying, I just got this cool piece of evidence that you're going to love. And I said, oh, and she's going to present it uh, later this month in, um, in um, Rochester, New York. I said, great. Is it the Benaha Williams Diaries? She wrote back and said, yeah. <laughs> How'd you know? So disappointed. Uh, she's right. Those diaries, Methodist ministers' diaries from that area, they witnessed that Joseph Smith described accurately a scene of unusual excitement on the subject of religion that commenced with the Methodists and soon became general among all the denominations competing for converts. So Joseph um, is a pretty good witness. You cannot prove whether he experienced the first vision by the historical method. You cannot disprove it either by the historical method or any other. You can prove it by asking in a faith, as he did, and getting your own revelation for it. I hope that's a helpful answer to that question, was it? Thanks for your time and attention.